Russia resorting to force to keep Ukraine out of NATO. Here's Mikhail Gorbachev in April of 1997 speaking to members of Congress, warning them about the planned expansion of NATO. And I am not persuaded by the assurances that we hear that Russia has nothing to worry about. You cannot, you may not humiliate a nation, a people, and think that uh, it'll have no consequences. So my question is, is this a new strategy? It was Gorbachev who Bush Sr. made the assurances to that NATO wouldn't expand. So when he talks about being humiliated, it's likely also personal. But just stop for a moment and think. This was 1997, 25 years ago. We've been aggressively expanding NATO for over two decades before Russia ultimately snapped. Another warning came in 2010. Here's Russian historian and NYU professor Stephen F. Cohen speaking at Carnegie Mellon. NATO expansion is not over for the Russians. It's a reality. NATO's sitting on its borders. It's not about future NATO expansion. It's about current. Uh, NATO expansion represents the following to Russia. And on the, near this, I will end. It represents a profoundly broken promise to Russia made by the first Bush that in return for United Germany and NATO, NATO would not expand eastward. This is, this is beyond any dispute. People say, well, they never signed a treaty. But a deal is a deal. The United States gives its word, unless we're shysters, and if you don't get it in writing, we'll cheat you. We broke our word. And when both Putin and Medvedev say publicly to Madeleine Albright and others, we, Russia, feel deceived and betrayed, that's what they're talking about. So NATO represents on the part of Russia a lack of trust. You break your words to us. What can, to what extent can we trust you? Secondly, it represents military encirclement. If you, look, if you sit in the Kremlin and you look out at where NATO is and where they want to go, it's everywhere. It's everywhere on Russia's borders. So he makes a great point about honoring our word, even if it isn't in writing, unless we're a bunch of shysters, he says. And maybe we are. In 2015, international relations expert John Mersheimer talked about how we're purposefully baiting Ukraine to take a hard line with Russia under false promises of inviting them into the West. But I actually think that what's going on here is that the West is leading Ukraine down the primrose path. And the end result is that Ukraine is going to get wrecked. And I believe that the policy that I'm advocating, which is neutralizing Ukraine and then building it up economically and getting it out of the competition between Russia on one side and NATO on the other side, is the best thing that could happen to the Ukrainians. What we're doing is encouraging the Ukrainians to play tough with the Russians. We're encouraging the Ukrainians to think that they will ultimately become part of the West because we will ultimately defeat Putin and we will ultimately get our way. Time is on our side. And of course, the Ukrainians are playing along with this and the Ukrainians are almost completely unwilling to compromise with the Russians and instead want to pursue a hardline policy. Well, as I said to you before, if they do that, the end result is that their country is going to be wrecked. And what we're doing is, in effect, encouraging that outcome. I think it would make much more sense for us to, neutral, to, to work to create a neutral Ukraine. It would be in our interest to bury this crisis as quickly as possible. It certainly would be in Russia's interest to do so. And most importantly, it would be in Ukraine's interest to put an end to the crisis. Ultimately, Ukraine gets wrecked, he says. And that was in 2015, and we're watching this now in real time. The Ukrainians and Russians sat down at peace talks, and rather than agree to become neutral, which is Russia's demand, Ukraine is taking a hard line, and we're witnessing their country get destroyed as a result. And now it's likely the country will be split in two or possibly three the further Ukraine goes into the conflict, unwilling to negotiate. Yesterday in Biden's State of the Union address, he said, quote, the NATO alliance was created to secure peace and stability in Europe after World War II. But I got to admit, it's not feeling like it. 
Biden also said Putin had rejected repeated efforts at diplomacy, but many of us are wondering what those diplomacy attempts were. Russia has been clear for nearly three decades now, no NATO on their borders. They've said it over and over and over again, and yet we've continued to expand. We've expanded NATO and invaded and occupied various areas of the Middle East. Europe has created a union of member nations, and yet all the while we've been accusing Russia of wanting to reestablish the USSR. We've even put missiles up to their border in our NATO member states as a response. And now we're all in danger, not just Ukrainians, of an all-out nuclear war because our leaders continue to refuse to back down. The irony is when Russia annexed Crimea and when Assad was accused of gassing his own people, American neocons were upset Obama had set a red line but refused to actually do anything about it when it was crossed. Those same neocons are shocked Putin actually said arming Ukraine is a red line and meant it. He wasn't bluffing and he's not going to back down. The Russians have told us this would happen for decades now. I see many people saying it shouldn't be up to us or Russia if Ukraine joins NATO, that each country should be allowed to decide for themselves. But it doesn't work like that. NATO isn't a right. It's a club. It's an agreement that if one nation is invaded, the others will come to their collective defense. We should be allowed to choose who we want to rush to the defense of and who we think will be, in, in, will be valuable in our defense when needed. The point of NATO is safety in numbers. But if adding a member makes the entire group unsafe, it defeats the point. But honestly, this entire situation with Ukraine and the U.S.'s unwillingness to militarily defend Ukraine because we don't want a nuclear war with Russia, which I agree with, calls into question the entire point to NATO. NATO was formed specifically to go to war with the Soviets. But if we're unwilling to go to war with them because it's a complete danger, then what is the actual purpose of NATO? But ultimately, my point is, the dog barked and barked and growled and growled. People even pointed year after year that the dog is growling and dangerous, yet we kept taunting the dog, and now the dog is attacking. And we're sitting here acting shocked, claiming that there was no provocation on our end. But the biggest issue is our unwillingness as a nation to put aside our exceptionalism and to sit here and think, we do no wrong. We are America, we do no wrong. And you've got Putin in a, he was at the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum in 2016, you know, looking very, very frustrated, speaking and saying, I don't know how to get through to you people anymore. We've said this over and over and over again. You guys are lying to us when you say that you're putting missiles right up to our border and you're telling us we have nothing to worry about, that it's all about Iran you know, that you're just trying to defend against Iran. And it's, he's like, you're lying to us and we know it. So what do we do now? You know, this is the big question. What do we do now and why our government works for us? We have to remember they're our government. They're doing this on our behalf. They're putting us in danger. We have to speak out and say, no, we're fed up. We're not gonna let you do this.